You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on the 14th day of December, 2020. You are tuned into episode 391 of the Corbett Report podcast, Solutions, Physical Media. Now, I don't know if you've had a chance to catch it yet, but in recent months, we received a new transmission from our would-be techno-fascist overlord, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. Yes, the great reef setter himself has once again appeared on his lofty stage to make one of his grand pronouncements, this time warning that the real existential threat to humanity may not be COVID-19, but something else entirely. Our reliance on digital services and infrastructure has exponentially increased due to the unprecedented connectivity which we have established now. From the adoption of large-scale working from home arrangements to the use of cloud services e-commerce, e-health, e-education. Many tech leaders have noted that within a couple of months we achieved such advancements in digital transformation that would have taken otherwise two, maybe three, maybe even more years. This paradigm shift to digital has made the role of cybersecurity as a global public good, even more pronounced. It serves as an enabler for business continuity and the silver threat for our connectivity. Yet, as businesses and organizations are putting great efforts to serve their customers, deliver essential services, and protect their employees amidst the pandemic, Cyber criminals have also been quick to exploit the increased vulnerabilities and the increased use that came along. The World Economic Forum recently published the COVID-19 Risks Outlook, the third greatest concern for companies surveyed is the increase of cyber attacks. We all know, but still pay insufficient attention to the frightening scenario of a comprehensive cyber attack, which would bring to a complete halt to the power supply, transportation, hospital services, our society as a whole. The COVID-19 crisis would be seen in this respect as a small disturbance in comparison. And now for the second time in recent weeks here on this podcast, I am compelled to assure you that I did not do any of that editing to that clip. I didn't do any of the dramatic close-ups on Klaus Schwab's face or anything. No, that is actually the way that this was broadcast. So make of that what you will. And once again, the Bond villain optics of this techno-fascist leader making his pronouncements from his grand stage certainly can be called into question, but I would say that is the obvious and low-hanging fruit of a presentation like this. So let's get a little bit more into the substance of what Herr Schwab was telling us there from his stage. And I think in order to do that, we need to ascertain the context of that. What what stage is he on? Where well, Who's he talking to? What's the context of this clip? And we can find that from a couple of places, uh, perhaps first and foremost from the page of cyberpolygon.com, where we learn on the about page that Cyber Polygon is a unique cybersecurity event that combines the world's largest technical training for corporate teams and an online conference featuring senior officials from international organizations and leading corporations. Every year, the training brings together a wide range of global businesses and government structures, while the live stream gathers 
millions of spectators from across the world. <laughs> I, I'm compelled to note, as uh, David Letterman did on our recent Propaganda Watch, where we were examining his interview with Edward Bernays, where Bernays said, well, yeah, we made 22 million children love soap. <laughs> and then Letterman said, really? <laughs> I, I'm inclined to say, really? Live stream gathers millions of spectators from across the world? Well, that's not what the YouTube view count monitor says. Not that I trust that as far as I can throw it, but still. <laughs> take, a, take, take that with a giant a grain of salt. But yes, Cyber Polygon is some sort of cybersecurity event that involves a, a live stream uh, a, a forum broadcast where various participants make pronouncements. And what we watched there were the welcoming remarks from our good friend Klaus Schwab, the, the most welcoming host one could imagine for an event like this. And why Klaus Schwab? Because as the, uh, the Cyber Polygon page goes on to note, uh, the World Economic Forum supports Cyber Polygon. Yes, Cyber Polygon is an initiative of BI.Zone, Zbear Ecosystem, supported by the World Economic Forum Center for Cybersecurity. So yes, of course, World Economic Forum is one of the key partners of this Cyber Polygon event, along with BI.Zone, which I will confess I don't know a lot about. I haven't researched deeply, but I do note... <laughs> humorously enough, is a Russian cybersecurity firm. Uh, so somehow uh, this Russian cybersecurity firm is now leading the Cyber Polygon event that's being hosted by the World Economic Forum in this age of hysteria and freakout over Russian hackers, which are apparently the existential threat to American democracy unless a Democrat gets elected, in which case it's totally fine, guys. But anyway, that's just a bizarre note. Um, but it follow up from that conference uh, involved an article that just came out a couple of weeks ago on hosted by the World Economic Forum on their page. Cybercrime is maturing. Here are six ways organizations can keep up that was actually submitted by BI Zone as a sort of a follow-up to this Cyber Polygon event. But anyway, there you go. So what, again, is Klaus Schwab saying? That, well, now that we've gone through this horrific, life-changing crisis of COVID-19 and are coming out on the other digital side of this event, this transformation, which is making us into a digitally dependent, not just economy, but society, where so much of our relations, our entire lives will be taking place online because heaven forfend, people meet their icky biological bodies in meat space. Oh, no, no, no. That's not how we're going to live our lives anymore. Even after everyone takes the experimental vaccine, we will not be meeting with real people in real space. You will be doing most of your life online, which does kind of raise some questions and concerns about cyber attacks and the growing threat from cyber criminals, let alone cyber terrorists. And you know what? I think he's right. It's just I don't trust Klaus Schwab or the Cyber Polygon uh, security event to tell me who are the real cyber terrorists or where the real threats come from. But yes, as we are increasingly shoehorned into a digital existence, yes, we do face greater threats of that digital uh, existence being massively disrupted by cyber attacks. And as Schwab points out, yes, potentially attacks that would be so significant they would make the entire COVID-19 crisis that we've just barely somehow by the skin of our teeth managed to live through this year seem trivial in comparison when you start talking about things like, oh, taking down the power grid uh, for a significant length of time. Yes, that could have some life-changing, world-historical, important uh, significance on, on this, the world stage. So yes, I think it is something that we need to keep our eyes on. But again, not, I think, for, uh, not, not in the way that is being suggested by Schwab. Um, this is something that hopefully a lot of my audience will be familiar with, not because this, uh, uh, this entire proceeding or its implications and ramifications have been deeply cogitated on by the controlled corporate press, but no, because independent researchers dug up this clip and have been talking about it. Researchers like Christian Westbrook, aka Ice Age Farmer, and I hope a lot of you have seen his clip on this particular uh, Schwab pronouncement, but if not, I will put it in the show notes, and let's take a little look at uh, the way that Christian presents a series of stories that are playing out in the news right now that do seem to suggest that some sort of massive cyber attack may be on the horizon for the next major hysteria freakout. And so when we hear the rhetoric from Klausi and Jeremy about this is going to be 
a crisis which dwarfs everything else. It happens ridiculously quickly and the impacts are off the scale. Everyone is affected. And then Klaus goes on to say the power grid goes down and the banking institutions are all involved. We can see here, banking will be affected. Now, I don't want to get too far into high octane speculation, but between the rhetoric and the participants, I think it's fair to say there is an event scripted in the near future to take down one or both the power grid and the finance. President Trump already passed in 2017 Executive Order 13800, which sought to harden the, uh, our infrastructure, especially critical infrastructure like the power grid, against cyber attacks, almost as if they have some insight into a potential threat along this vector. And then certainly throughout this last nine months of the pandemic, and it's, it's not just the World Economic Forum that's talking about this, we have been pummeled with predictive programming through the media about the threats to our power grid particularly. Take a look. Even most recently from the New York Times, it is the same Russians who hacked the election that are now targeting the power grid in our nuclear plants. Uh, you can't... I'm just going to let that sit there. I don't think you can make this up at this point. The propaganda is so thick and dense, they're weaving their Russian hacker story right along into this cybersecurity and power grid story. But again, look at, look at the, 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 the uh, tapestry that has been woven over these last few months. Hackers are targeting the remote workers who keep your lights on. As I said, now that they're having to work remotely and write down passwords willy-nilly, uh, hackers can target them, and this includes utility companies, cybersecurity, more important than ever due to COVID-19. This was in May, as time goes on. This is from the World Economic Forum. Why COVID-19 is making utilities more vulnerable to cyber attacks and what we can do about it. This is back in April. Again, they've been laying the framework, creating that foundation and, and uh, establishing the predictive programming. From the Hill in August, officials warn of increasing cyber threats to our critical infrastructure during the pandemic, notably the power grid. Moving on in September, whether facing a cyber attack or a pandemic, preparation is critical. And we're going to explain why cybersecurity is critical for the utility industry now in the era, the new normal of COVID-19. Even most recently, just in the end of October, Cybersecurity is going to be a crucial priority in utility companies' agenda as threats continue to grow amid COVID-19. And then just last week, the U.S. power sector has prevented millions of cyber attacks in 2020, which takes 24-7 commitment. Now they're giving you the sense that these attacks are already happening, that it's constantly happening, and it's only by virtue we're hanging by a thread at any moment. This team of incredibly talented people, might they might actually fail, and then we'd be going back to the Stone Age for some amount of time. So I just wanted to mention that the media has been planting this seed as well. And you need to be aware of this, and we need to be discussing this, trying to keep it from happening by virtue of spreading the word about it, if at all possible. But certainly we need to be bracing for it and understanding exactly who the players are behind it and that this is absolutely a critical part of the larger Great Reset agenda that the World Economic Forum is out there pushing right now. There's a reason Klaus Schwab is running this event, talking about cybersecurity in 2020 suddenly being a new risk to you. Once again, that is Christian Westbrook of IceAgeFarmer.com. I hope you'll follow the link in the show notes back to that original report so you can view it in its entirety and look at Christian's other work. But I think that is a pretty nice summation of the fact that, the, that we are being prepared for some sort of event that might involve disruption of the power grid itself. And there are many ways that we could see that such an event However it were to take place, whether through genuine cyber attack from a real enemy of freedom and the U.S. allies, or whether a false flag staged event, would play a number of purposes uh, in helping to facilitate the rise of the Great Reset techno-fascist order, because one could well imagine uh, that after a week, two weeks of no power, uh, you could imagine how people would be left begging for any solution to this quandary. Anything you want to do, just 
turn the power back on. I'm sure a hundred years ago, society could have dealt with wide-scale, massive power grid disruptions and more or less carried on with their lives. But in 2020, how many days before people would be out on the streets doing anything, begging for someone to please turn the power back on? And so that is definitely a power move that is in the bag of tricks, unfortunately, of the tricksters who like to perform false flag events in order to bring about their agendas. More on which, on that broad topic and some of the disturbing things underlying it, you can find in a recent editorial I penned on When False Flags Go Virtual, where I went into some depth, depth about the history of this idea of a cyber false flag, a virtual false flag, and what that might look like, uh, how it might play out, the fact that there is an I Patriot Act waiting, sitting in the, the on the desks of various Congress critters waiting for an I-911 to come along. Again, all of this is well-documented history that I do go through in that article and talk about some of the implications of that. And on the note specifically of some sort of wide-scale power grid disruption, the literalizing of the dark winter that we've been hearing so much about, what if it becomes a very dark winter, quite literally, through an event like that? It certainly could. Uh, well, I've talked about that potential before on the podcast, specifically episode 254 of the Corbett Report podcast, an EMP false flag, where I did talk about the potential for some sort of EMP event to take out power grids or and to essentially render the population helpless unless they are prepared for such an event. So if you are interested in that subject, I would suggest you go and Refamiliarize yourself or familiarize yourself with that material. There's a lot to dig into there. But today we're not going to look at that, that bigger, bigger picture of the complete Mad Max scenario, but we are going to look at some of the ramifications of this digitalization of our lives and what that might mean for the future, if not through some sort of spectacular cyber false flag, but at the very least, the way that the Orwellian memory hole could become a very real, very literal thing. And of course, I do not need to explain to my regular audience about Orwell 1984 memory hole. You will already understand that reference. But yes, in, of course, in 1984, uh, Winston Smith did work at the Ministry of Truth, where he helped send pieces of history down the memory hole where it was never uh, seen again, uh, taking out bits of old newspapers and other such uh, um, artifacts of history and making sure that they are erased, expunged from history, airbrushed out of existence digitally, if need be, so that they are never seen again and that the correct version of history is written in to take its place, which sounded like some sort of science fiction back in the 1940s when Orwell was penning that, even though, of course, we do know that that's essentially exactly what the Soviets were doing at the time, literally airbrushing uh, people out of photographs once they've been uh, expunged from the party and thus erased from history and things like that. So there was that level of things going on even 60, 70, 80 years ago. But yes, in the digital age, that airbrushing can take place in a much more refined way. And you and I might notice it, people who have grown up with certain understandings of the world and of history for decades or uh, the better part of a century for some of the old hats in the crowd, will be able to see through such tricks. But will our children, will our children's children, who grow up in a completely digital age and who may never ever have known that this or that event took place or took place in that way, this of course goes to the heart of what I've been ringing the alarm bell about, uh, especially recently with the burning of the li uh, digital library of Alexandria. Uh, but there are other even creepier connotations and implications of this. I mean, it just, it goes so much more deeper into the digitalization of the economy generally. So we're going to look at a specific example of that, this time coming from, of course, Aaron and Melissa Dykes over at Truthstream Media, which I'm sure my audience will be familiar with. But if not, yes, of course, you should be following Aaron and Melissa's works. And you'll notice that a couple of months ago, they had a, a particularly important video up, a 42-minute exploration about, and then they came for the books, talking about the potential creation of the memory hole uh, down which actual real written history can be can be sent you see Aaron and Melissa of course as I'm sure you know if you follow their work do big 
deep documentary style dives and sometimes deep documentaries like The Minds of Men and other other things like that that are definitely worth checking out because they are deeply researched. But in order to do that deep research, of course, Aaron and Melissa do not just spend all their time online reading, reading blogs or watching YouTube videos. No, they go to libraries and the, uh, the closest depository library to Aaron and Melissa is a university library that, as Aaron explains in the video, he often goes to to check out old books or just to research uh, facts that are impossible to find online at this point. However, of course, that, along with everything else, has been disrupted during the year of COVID uh, to the point where, unless you are registered faculty or staff active um, members of the university, you're not going to get on campus to go to the library. So physical access has been prevented. And as Aaron discovers, as he starts going down that particular rabbit hole in that video, uh, this is actually part of a deeper rollout of something called the Haiti Trust, which probably not a lot of people have heard about yet, but probably will if they are the type who actually go to libraries. And it turns out that one of the reasons this is happening is because most of the major libraries attached to universities across the entire country and possibly across the world have entered into an agreement with something known as the Haiti Trust. Uh, it looks like Hathi Trust, uh, but they say it's pronounced Haiti, much like the country. And it's a reference to an elephant with the idea that an elephant never forgets, and so that's information in books. And, and the Haiti Trust is a digital library, and they become pretty much the major repository for scan books, research materials, etc. And I, I think the, the vast majority, if not 100% of their materials, have all been scanned by Google, uh, which could prove to be important. But at any rate... At libraries like the ones I'm dealing with, whereas you used to be able to physically walk in, go to the shelves, or use their computer database, find the book. Um, for years now, you could click a button and have that book be ready to pick up at the desk, waiting for you, assigned to you, waiting to check out, check out with your library card, and you're on your way. They also, for many years, have had scanned books and documents, many of them from the Google sources, and you could just use those online. Pretty good deal. Point is, you had the chance to check them out. But now, many of the libraries, the one near me, is no longer allowing physical access to books. What they call the pick it up option, where you look up a book, decide you want it, click the button, have it waiting for you, is theoretically open, but only to students, faculty, and staff right now. Again, I understand. I don't agree, but I understand. Except that they now won't let you go physically into the library. You can't browse the stacks, which quite frankly has been very valuable many times. Um, have found a lot of stuff there that I wouldn't have found looking up. You can't do that. They've rolled it back to what they call the pick it up option, where you basically order the book and it's waiting for you at the desk and to keep people physically out of the libraries where there used to be, you know, considerable amount of people congregating. I don't know if a lot of them were really studying academically versus hanging out, but not the point. Now you can only pick the books up. Okay, fine. However, they now have an agreement because of the Hathi Trust that they may not lend any physical copies of books that the Haiti Trust has in their digital collection. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? What would you need books for? I just want to study up on some things. They now have an agreement through the Haiti Trust, and because of their participation in the Haiti Trust, which, uh, generally speaking, has knitted together a network of primarily universities across the country using this because they're allowing access to their digital collections. They are no longer allowing physical copies of books to be lent out to the library. It isn't that my local university library themselves have decided it's not a good idea to lend out physical books. Although, um, they're delivering mail and packages and boxes on a daily basis, and they've told the country 
that this thing won't be spread that way and it's fine to get your mail and your packages, but they've somehow decided books are an issue. Yeah, books always spreading the plague, books always an epidemic, right? But now they may not lend out physical copies of books that have been scanned by this Haiti Trust digital library collection. Once again, Truthstream Media, and I hope you will go and watch that full report in which, in this case, Aaron specifically does flesh out in a great degree of detail the real ramifications of this precedent that is being set right now to restrict actual physical access to books. But don't worry, you've got the digital equi equivalent. And I note that uh, the Haughty Trust, as I see it is uh, pronounced on their page, uh, according to their records, is uh, remarkable, as, as Aaron points out later in that video, it's a remarkable research tool that really does potentially give us access to an incredible, almost un unimaginable amount of information. And I can attest to this before I even saw that particular report from Truthstream Media back in February of this year when I delivered my uh, uh, Church of the Holy State worship service uh, at Anarchopoco, uh, you might recall that I referenced specifically an 1893 essay by Richard T. Ely that appears in the pages of Harper's Weekly. And when I posted that talk to my site as a podcast episode, I did include the show note link to the Hadi Trust, where you can see not just the words that Ely wrote in that essay nearly 130 years ago, but you can literally see the scan of that page of Harper's Weekly. You can actually see it in its original context, in its original typeface set there on the digital page. It's quite amazing. It's quite an incredible tool for researchers. There's uh, even a few years ago, it wouldn't have been possible for me to have brought that up and to link to it and to show it, let alone, I mean, even to read that essay would have been virtually, if not impossible, it would have been exceptionally laborious and likely would not have made it into that podcast. But here it is, click of a button, and there it is on my screen. So what could go wrong? Well, of course, you probably, I would imagine, most of you are starting to see how this could go very wrong. I mean, who is this Haughty Trust anyway? And you can get more information about them from the launch of Haughty Trust on their, their page. They have a page up about this from October of 2008 and talking about the consortium of uh, libraries and research institutions that have banded together to make available these millions upon millions upon millions of digitized books, some of which are in the public domain, some of which are copyrighted. And so, of course, they have all sorts of strictures about what look books can be virtually lent out and under what conditions. But of course, all of those strictures, well, they had to be tightened a little bit because of the pandemic and because of these all these institutions that now want digital access to these books rather than relying on people to physically come to the library and get them out. So there are, as Aaron goes on to state in that video, there are a lot of libraries that now are actually restricting. You cannot take out physical books because we don't want to spread any of your cooties uh, during the pandemic. So they will grant, of course, the accredited and official alumni, staff, and faculty of these university and research institutions, generally speaking, uh, will grant them digital access, but it's the same thing. I mean, what's the difference? So for example, you can go to George Mason University, which has this post up from September of this year. How does Haughty Trust Emergency Temporary Access Service work? Why can't I check out a physical copy of a Haughty Trust item if it is in the library's collections? Good question. To which they respond, uh, through the Haughty Trust Emergency Temporary Access Service, ETAS, because of course everything needs a catchy acronym, current Mason students, faculty, and classified staff have full view access to items in the library's collections, which match a digitized copy in Haughty Trust. Read more about the Haughty Trust ETAS program and how to access it here. Items available through the ETAS can be checked out for one hour. If you are still actively looking at the book and no one else is attempting to check it out, the book will be renewed automatically. Uh, each institution participating in the Haughty Trust ETAS has access only to the number of digital copies that match the institution's physical holdings. For example, if the libraries hold only one print copy on the shelves, then only one user affiliated with Mason can ac access the digital book in Haughty Trust at a time. Please be courteous and return books as soon as you're done with them, etc., etc. All right, so we see how this system is working out during this emergency temporary access uh, time that we're living through right now. Well, there's this 
thing spreading around, so you're only going to get digital access, and we only have one physical copy, so we will only lend out one virtual copy. Of course, we could lend out a million. We could may lend out a billion, but uh-oh, copyright. And as we all know, we have to abide by the copyright law, right? Uh, if you don't know about the copyright swindle and intellectual monopoly uh, system that has been put into place by the monopolists, then I would suggest you check out uh, Steal This Podcast, Please, a previous edition of this podcast. But at any rate, yes, I understand why they're doing this within the insane strictures of the system as it exists. And it looks uh, very much like archive.org, as I'm sure some of my research-inclined audience will know about. Uh, yes, they used to lend out books for, uh, I think, two weeks at a time. Now it's one hour at a time. And of course, you have to wait in line if anybody else is reading it and all of that sort of nonsense. Well, those, those types of uh, strictures have been placed on access. So now you can't physically access a book. And now even if there is a digital copy, you have to wait in line and you can get access for one hour if you're lucky, etc. So this is the way things are going to play out in the increasingly digitized age. But it gets a whole lot creepier when you start to think about the ways that this system can become uh, so cemented into place that physical books, do we even need them on our shelves anymore? Do we ever need to give access to our physical book collections ever again? Why? We're all doing everything at home, remotely, on, on the online, on screens anyway. Why, why have physical books? We'll just give people access to the digital co collection. And then suddenly, I mean, you ha start to have the question about, well, who is stewarding over this digital collection and what works get included and what works get excluded? And, well, of the works that are there, uh, can we be absolutely sure that this is the exact same uh, edition and copy and, and print and everything as the physical version? And who is going to make sure of that? And how do we know if a word gets taken out here or a picture gets inserted there or a page or a chapter goes missing here or there? Who would ever know? If we exclude the physical media from the equation, how will we ever know? Because there will only be one digital copy that, don't worry, guys, is stewarded over by the haughty trust, and you can trust them. I mean, they've got trust in their name. <laughs> oh, boy. Yes, you don't have to be particularly conspiratorially inclined to see where this could go. And if that doesn't sh send shivers down your spine, then you're not paying attention, because this is one of the things that we are facing when we face this increasingly digitized age. Yes, there are the Mad Max scenarios of power grids going down, etc., but even just the idea of information becoming digitized and the real physical copies of it disappearing is itself a problem. So well, as I was contemplating this problem and these ideas, I wanted to stress the importance of physical media that we can physically possess as a counterbalance to the digitization that is going on right now. Obviously, there are incredibly fundamentally systemic problems with the system as it's being constructed around us, but uh, and probably problems that we as individuals can't do a lot to directly contradict. But we can take some of that power back into our own hands, with at least with our own collections of media. And of course, as you can see behind me, the physical books that are an important part of what I do. Uh, as Like everyone else, I have also started to accrue a massive collection of digital books. Luckily, thankfully, most of them are physically possessed by me on external hard drives that I have downloaded and have preserved for myself. But again, if the power switch gets flipped and suddenly we're without power, well, all of that's useless. And the only thing I would have left are the physical books. So, yes, physical books physical media of all kinds, CDs or DVDs, actual videos that you can put into your player that you yourself will be able to uh, to see, regardless of whether they get memory hold because some snowflake at Spotify decided they don't like a certain idea or a certain subject or a certain naughty word or whatever it is, and that gets memory hold, well, it will be preserved for you. And you might, you might be a Simpsons fanatic who has every episode of The Simpsons including the ones that got memory hole, like the, the Michael Jackson episode. We can't have that as streaming on whatever it is, Disney Plus or whatever it is that streams it. I don't know or care. But 
If you have the DVD, you have that episode forever. Well, there you go. So it, there are it, there's definitely an importance to that, and it, it extends beyond simply just the preservation of the information, although that is obviously the most fundamentally important aspect of this. But there is a tactile and and uh, and a, a real difference in the way that we learn information from physical media and physical books than we do when consuming it on a screen. I, I, I really wanted to talk about these ideas with someone who I knew would understand them, so I racked my brain, and definitely the first person that popped into my head to talk about these matters was my good friend, the always impeccably dressed Richard Andrew Grove. Because I thought to myself, self, I know a lot of people, but who do I know that has a genuinely impressive collection of physical books. And I racked my brain and you were absolutely the top of that list. You are always pulling out not only books referencing, you know, what you're talking about, but specifically like old books, books out of print, you know, rarities, all sorts of stuff that most people don't have access to. Uh, I want to get pick your brain a little bit about book book reading, and the, the value of physical books. Uh, here's an example. I was watching a recent Grand Theft World where you mentioned one of my reports. Uh, I think it was when I was talking to Pete Quinones. At any rate, um, you uh, cut to your room there and you pulled out Superclass by David Rothkopf, which I had mentioned, and you went through some of the passages of it, which is great. Awesome. Uh, that's a book more people should probably know about, and I'm glad you, you did that. Um, but it just, you know, it occurred to me, wow, this guy has the reference for everything, and he's got it all in his library. So, Let's let's get some details there. Uh, let's talk about your library a little bit. How many books would you estimate that you have? I have a lot less. I have a lot fewer books than when I moved into this house. And now that we have to move again soon, I'm going to be, yeah, trying to whittle it down. But I I have mainly books because before before I started learning for myself, I didn't have a whole lot of books. I didn't need a lot of books. I thought I had been programmed to know everything. I had a college degree. I'm being successful. I read Wall Street Journal, New York Times. I'm good. I watch whatever and I learn. But then I started to encounter things that uh, weren't on my terrain, uh, weren't on my map, but they were definitely part of the terrain. And I started looking into, you know, trying to use the internet. And I couldn't make heads or tails of it because I'm like, what's the sources? Nobody was doing a good job of presenting where the source material comes from. And so I was having trouble integrating that which exists that there is information about it on the internet but i didn't really trust it so i said if i start getting older books pre-internet and if i first you know if i get the first editions of these books it's not even like they changed it in a reprint then i could start to gain some traction and there are uh, i mean in this room there's uh this is the middle size room so there's another bigger room that has books there's this room and then there's the books in my office which is a much more condensed and potent collection i actually i want to specifically address digital versus physical um, yeah. because you have an impressive physical library my library physically is not so impressive i have a big digital library but i mean there are dangers to working with digital libraries uh give us your thoughts on digital versus physical i like digital when it's a book i'm not familiar with and i need to word search it to see what topics are in there these sort of things but otherwise i really don't read a whole lot of books online i don't uh, i don't have a kindle uh, if you ha give me something to read that it's serious, I'll probably print it out because then I can mark it up and I can instantly, like I'm a very tactile, there's something about tactile learning. And I think that goes away when everything's ubiquitous on the same screen all the time. It's just, it's not as registering in your mind. I also think that as I learn and I, for instance, uh, put something in my history blueprint, the, the, the action of putting those thoughts in there and connect, making those connections, adding the attachments, it's building neurons in my brain. So I would credit a lot of my memory about the content that I'm interacting with, not just taking my reading seriously, or if you have the audio version, read and listen at the same time. That's a, that's a huge step for it, but I don't do that very often. Um, I don't listen to things fast, so I don't push 2x to listen. I just listen at normal speed. And if it's not worth listening at normal speed, like, you know, then I might not do it. Um, electronic books. Um, they are really great to be able to pass to other people. So if there's a bunch of source material, like for instance, uh, I don't have the real book of the Reese Committee hearings. I have a PDF that can be printed out that Charlotte Iserby rescued and saved and these sort of things. Um, there are some documents like that, but anything substantial like, um, you know, the last will and testament of Cecil Rhodes, you can get that on archive.org. I don't know, like, uh, you know, it's a PDF, 
But when you have the actual book and the book version, the version of the book I have was William T. Stead's personal copy. And it's stamped on the inside review of reviews. This was the guy who wrote the last will and testament. So, I wrote, so I'm like, this is the surest thing that's on the market out there. And I have the story of the guy who bought that whole library from a review of reviews once upon a time. It's interesting, but yeah, having the artifact or even um, some of these earlier pre Carol Quigley books I have over here, Porter Sargent on um, education and war and the fact that our schools were being changed to get into a war mentality. And that uh, according to this Pilgrim society book right here, they were changing the attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs of people in the 1920s to be more pro-British through changing American history books. So this ties back into maybe that selling war topic that you opened up with, James, where there's a there's a group who has a superior set of experience to a nascent America who didn't in the 20th century have their own intelligence network. The East India Company's intelligence network, I'm sorry, the British Empire's intelligence network, MI6, like it goes back in history and there's a lot of evidence of how it evolved over time, why it over evolved over time too. And America got sucked into that. And before you knew it, we were playing in the great game, which is another whole great idea. There's a ton of books on that concept and the new great game that they're seeking to play with us right now in this great reset. Um, and I just really feel like it's in getting into the books. Plus books are cool. They're like, they're like the, the albums, like, you know, people obsess over their LP vinyl with the album covers and everything. It's like, if you don't have a copy of the book and, you know, the, the cover art, uh, this was done by our graphic artist, Greg Hardesty, by the way, because I thought Sean's cover was lacking. I was like, hey, man, we can make you a cool cover. And I couldn't, I conceptualized this and I said to Greg, can we have an American flag with the Union Jack? Because that's what the Pilgrim Society, that's what Conan Doyle said. Can we have a flag that has both things on it and unite and take over the world? That's these people's goal. They haven't been, um, uh, confronted people haven't understood the legacy of information because people like us are still in the process of articulating it. Uh, but now, now I think there's a lot of good reason for people to, to wake up and smell the coffee. They, there's something going on. There's a long history behind it. It didn't just happen with this, this pandemic plague situation. Um, and there's going to be a lot more changes really, really quickly because they basically moved their plan 10 years ahead of time. And fortunately for us, I think technologically, we might have been 15 years ahead. So we might still have a buffer even after they do this great reset and the shake up and the Bitcoin and all this other stuff. But uh, I remain the eternal optimist because I, I learn so much every day that I know I couldn't have been that smart yesterday. And so because there's this unknown and I don't take it as a threat, I take it as an opportunity to learn and outgrow our fears. I can continue to engage in all this work with a, a smile and a plan and the resourcefulness to get her done. Now, as I hope my audience is aware, that is Richard Andrew Grove of the Autonomy Course of Action, teaching people the tools for success that are not taught in universities or business schools. Uh, that is available at getautonomy.info. But in that particular clip, he was appearing as host of the Grand Theft World podcast, which is taking place every Sunday night and is compiling clips and going through and researching different things live on air. It's a it's an interesting experience, as I hope you have seen with some of my recent productions. Uh, and I did appear on Grand Theft World to talk to Richard specifically about books. And I hope you'll go and listen to that full conversation that we had over an hour of discussion where we got into some book recommendations. I was pulling books off the shelf and showing them. I did post that up, the audio of that up as an audio interview on my site, but you might want to check out the video so you can see us physically grabbing the books and showing them and going through them and highlighting passages uh, of a worthwhile endeavor, if only to model exactly what I'm talking about. The fact that there is so much information that we can have at our own fingerprints that cannot be uh, taken away from us unless they are physically taken away by agents of the state, boot, boot marching into our house and physically taking them, which is a whole lot more work than simply flipping a switch and digitally erasing entire collections of information. So again, I want to stress that something that we can do to take our power back into our own hands is at least commit to having and possessing an actual copy of the information that we are relying on or that is useful to us. And so uh, once again, I hope that conversation that I had with Richard is interesting to people who are already inclined or hopefully inspiring to people who are wondering what 
Why, why do I need books? Why do I need physical media? Well, if you need further inspiration, I also recently talked to my good friend and, of course, co-host of New World Next Week, James Evan Pilato, who I'm sure you will know in the context of his work at MediaMonarchy.com as the king of the media kingdom over there at Media Monarchy, where he does have, of course, as is prominently displayed in every edition of New World Next Week, a an impressive collection of physical media, uh, a lot of LPs, a lot of records, but uh, books as well, and other um, physical media of different sorts that he has referred to. And that's only what he has in his possession in his particular uh, home, but he also has the uh, Compound East, or whatever he calls it, uh, back in home uh, with his family in West Virginia, where he also has, uh, I'm sure, many, many more uh, pieces of physical media for that he's collected over decades. And so, uh, again, uh, he obviously came up as someone that I should probably be talking to when it comes to the importance of having access to tactile physical media. So I recently had the chance to ask him about that. I think the easiest answer to why do we want to hang on to physical things, if perhaps not to the extreme degree that people like myself have, James is, I think, the real simple one from, I mean, it's several years back. I believe the headline was, Amazon removes copies of 1984 from people's devices. And it was some story about how it was... uh, some illegal version of the book, something about the copyrights or the or the production or blah, blah, blah. Basically, the store was like, oh, this isn't you know, allowed. They removed it from people's devices that had already bought it. I can't think of a better way to really tell the story of why physical media might be important with that kind of, you know, allegorical big brother type of story. So we talk about physical media. These are, these are my records. I mean, you can see a bunch of them. You can look up on top of here. Tons of books. You see those weird little brown cases. Those are filled with cassette tapes and actually eight track tapes. The neat thing about being a media nerd is once you kind of put that word out to people and they know you're into that stuff, they'll give you their things when they don't want them anymore. So all the cassette tapes from my grandma all kinds of Italian eight tracks from from another grandma. I've I've got all that stuff. You can see all these records, but meanwhile, the things that people can't actually see are in other places of the room. I use these little crates. They're the like Sterilite crates. I think they say they're for, you know, CDs and DVDs, but they are perfect for seven inch records, 45s, they call them. So I keep all of those in here and I have a couple dozen of these that you can't see actually out of the shots. Meanwhile, I've also actually been upgrading some of my boxes as well. These, again, dozens of these are filled with decades of magazines and books and comics. You know, I mentioned recently on the air that my buddy Jeff from Architects and Engineers from 9-11 Truth, he sent me the entire archive of Covert Action Quarterly, the magazine that I don't even know if they print it anymore. Of course, printing magazines is a tough proposition in 2020. But that to me, again, is is why it's always kind of been important and nobody can take it away. I mean, one of the good things about records are they're really heavy and unwieldy. If, God forbid, something would ever happen. And of course, I usually like to keep what I have somewhat secret to anybody that might actually be nearby. I would imagine if someone came in, the robbers came in, they would go for the gear. They'd go for the turntables. And for me, I don't care about that stuff, man. That's just the machine that plays the stuff. It's the stuff that I actually care about. And these records, again, my own personal collection inside all kind of them. You'll have posters from the concert where I bought it, maybe autographs, maybe all kinds of set lists or things kind of put in. So for me, they've all been personalized. I mean, they say James on them. You can see some of the posters here behind me. Hey, James, love Nelly physical poster i guess i guess it, is it because we're the what do they call it the oregon trail generation that we're essentially generation x i totally know what it's like to not have the internet or any of this stuff it would be a, it would be a, a, an adjustment to be sure if it all disappeared but we're the last generation that knows what it's like to not have all this computerized stuff and to have to go back to physical media again i think for me i just uh even the 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 feeling of it james the the feeling of i love that i love the feeling of a cassette tape and i love moving it around in my hands and one-handed and i can even show you this is uh 
Aldous Huxley narrating Brave New World on CBS Sci-Fi Radio from the 50s. I got this from the Sci-Fi Book Club back in the 90s. I've just voraciously collected things, and, and I basically have treated the internet like it's a temporary thing. I've basically always treated the internet like it could disappear, and that's why I've copied everything. I've got spindles and spindles and spindles and spindles of data DVDs that have essentially everything I've done for 15 years on Media Monarchy. Uh, an amazing listener and now member of Media Monarchy, he actually donated a Dell server tower recently. So while that's not physical media, I'm super excited to just start loading that baby up with the entire Media Monarchy archives, every article, every bit, every clip. So many things, James, have really been memory hold from the web. When I try and do my This Day in History or, oh, here's the thing I published to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, oh, the story's gone. Not from my archives, it's not, because I save HTML copies of, of every article I go over on every show every morning. So that's how I've always done it. And again, I, it can border on, I'll joke with people a lot of times, you know, I have the collector's disease. But I love it. I mean, comics, records, books, magazines, all of it. It's just always been, it's, again, I, I don't call it media monarchy for nothing. Now, as I know, I won't need to tell my regular listeners that, of course, was James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. And I'd like to think that if you are similarly interested in media, you will probably already have followed James over to MediaMonarchy.com, where you can find his daily live stream Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Mountain Time. He calls it the best damn radio station you never heard. And in addition to the Morning Monarchy podcast, where he goes through the news of the day, he also has Pump Up the Volume. He hosts old-time radio shows, those kinds of things. So I would highly suggest that if you haven't yet done so, you check that out over at MediaMonarchy.com. But having said that, I hope that the larger point that I'm attempting to make here today is not lost on my regular audience, namely the importance of having physical access to your media, whether those be physical books or tapes or uh, records or DVDs or those types of things, uh, the things that you can have locally that you do not depend on your online access for. Uh, because as James Evan Pilato often remarks, uh, there is no such thing as the cloud. It's just someone else's computer. And are you really going to trust Apple or Amazon or Google to safeguard this data for you forever? Of course you should not. You should have physical, local access to your media. And that's why I always say, when you are online and you see something of importance, uh, an article, a video, a podcast, save a copy onto your hard drive, put it on an external hard drive, whatever you have to do to make sure that you have your own local access to that, that you can have even if the internet goes down. And yes, if we go into Mad Max scenario and they take down the power grid and we never have access to electricity again, then I guess we're back to the Stone Age and the only thing you will have access to are your physical books. But barring that, it is important to have at least local access to your media because, again, you cannot rely on the internet always being there and always providing it for you. So having made that point... Uh, I think it would be a performative contradiction for me not to then provide some way of having f physical access to the Corbett Report media. And on that note, as again, longtime listeners of the Corbett Report will know, uh, yes, for many years now, I have sold DVDs that provide physical access to uh, my documentaries, compilations of videos, and even the data DVDs that are the compilations of the MP3 and MP4 files that make up the audio and video productions uh, of the Corbett Report. That's kind of the archive of all of this work that hopefully you have uh, purchased in the past. Um, because this year, as you may have all also noted, I have had to suspend sales of DVDs because I found I was shipping DVDs out. But because of this global disruption that we've experienced this year, more often than not, they were being returned to me. I couldn't guarantee delivery. In fact, I could almost guarantee it wasn't being delivered at a certain point. So I had to suspend my DVD sales. I'm going to try opening it up again here for December on a test basis, see how it goes, and hopefully, if it goes well, I can start offering more DVDs for sale again next month. But let's just try it and see how the delivery really works here or fails to work. 
And we're going to try it with one DVD in particular, a new one that I haven't had for sale before. This is Who is Bill Gates? Obviously, the four parts of my Bill Gates exploration that appears uh, that appeared at CorbettReport.com slash Gates earlier this year. Of course, as with all my work, this is 100% available for free audio, video, and the complete hyperlinked transcript of the complete documentary. So that is uh, up forever and always at CorbettReport.com slash Gates or at least as long as you can access CorbettReport.com slash Gates. So you are free, of course, to take that and to burn your own DVD or whatever you have to do to spread this information to others. All of my work is under a Creative Commons 4.0 non-commercial uh, commercial <laughs> attribution non-commercial license, which is a tongue-twisty way of saying that as long as you provide a link back to the source and as long as you're not selling it for profit, then you're fine. You can spread it any way you like, in any form you like, to anyone you like. Uh, please do so. But if you want to A, support this website, and B, have easy, handy-dandy access to a physical copy of this, you can purchase this DVD. It's a single disc. It contains the full two-hour Bill Gates documentary and, as a bonus, the Who is Bill Gates uh, music video um, by Kodomo-san. So this is available. It's going to be for a list price of $20, but as with every December, there will be a 25% off Christmas sale, so you can get it for $15. I'll be basically just about making cost on this, um, but because I am highly motivated to get physical copies of this out there, I think this documentary in particular is one of the most important things that we can be spreading right now, so I hope people will do that. Having said that, I'm not going to spend all December making thousands of DVDs, so I'm going to make a certain number of them and then stop. And so if you really want one, I suggest you get your order in quickly. Uh, they will be going. Um, but hopefully this will go a little bit more smoothly than usual because I do have a certain number of copies in New Mexico with James. Uh, he physically has some copies that he's going to be shipping out for the U.S. orders. So there won't be any international shipping for U.S. orders. Hopefully it will go more smoothly. Hopefully you'll get it more quickly. Having said that, I do not guarantee that this will be there for Christmas. In fact, I guarantee it will not be there for Christmas. So please don't don't rely on this being a Christmas stocking stuffer. I don't think that's going to work, uh, just given the time constraints. But uh, I hope you do at least think about getting a copy at CorbettReport.com slash shop. All right, having said all of that, uh, I, again, I hope that the bigger point that I'm making here today uh, is not lost on this audience. It is an important one. We do need to make sure that we preserve local physical access to our media of various sorts because you cannot rely on the internet being forever there and forever a faithful guardian and, uh, and, and trusty servant uh, when it comes to handling this information. There are some deeply disturbing things that uh, some of the would-be rulers of this world are attempting to bring about right now, and uh, Cyber Polygon is just one insight into what could potentially happen. So again, there's a lot that needs to be said and a lot of different things that need to be done, but one thing that you can do today to start taking access uh, back into your own hands is to make sure you have physical copies of this media. Having said that, I think we're going to leave it there for today. Uh, once again, this is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Thank you for joining me, and I'm looking forward to talking to you again in the near future. Computer whiz kid. Part of your genius is that you are a computer whiz. Cutthroat businessman. The U.S. Justice Department contended that the software giant had breached antitrust laws. Selfless philanthropist. Bill, even your harshest critic would have to admit that your philanthropy work is planet-shaking incredible. Ruthless eugenicist. But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. As more and more of our world is coming to rely on Bill Gates for his guidance. One of the best informed voices is that of businessman and philanthropist Bill Gates. It is time to ask what really lies behind Gates' quest for control. Things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. It is time to ask, who is Bill Gates? Watch the complete documentary for free at CorbettReport.com slash Gates, or support the work and purchase a DVD copy at CorbettReport.com slash shop.